Welcome once again to Cinemaholics. This is a special bonus episode of the show. We are devoting to the 2020 Oscars, which is just days away from airing. And we are picking the winners ourselves, because who can trust Hollywood? I mean, really. Joining me for our golden jaunt through some of the best work of the films of 2019 is our very own Extra Milestone co-host, Sam Nolan. Sam, how are you? I'm good, John. I was not anticipating to be introduced first, so I'm a little off guard right now, but in the best possible way. (laughs) That's right. We have someone else. You know him, you love him, but the jury's still out on whether or not you'll love his Oscar picks. It's our (laughs) co-host on the main show, Will Ashton. Hello, hello. And last, I am your Oscars host for this evening, John Negroni, though unlike other Oscars hosts, I guess not this year because we don't have one like last year, (laughs) I get to vote as well, which is great news for me and me only (laughs) so we are dedicating this bonus oscar show to uh, a a segment that used to come on all the time back back in the heyday of film criticism and that was siskel and ebert's if we picked the winners that was the sound the music you were hearing at the beginning of the show and i love that program a lot and i know will and sam you're somewhat familiar with if we pick the winners as well and we're, we're sort of uh, ripping off that format a little bit, kind of doing our own thing, too. But we are going to be picking the winners. We are not going to be predicting the 2020 Oscars because uh, I don't want to. I mean, did you guys want to? Am I am I being um, bossy here? No. No, I think you're not fine. at all. <laughs> that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Well, th- uh, th- my reasoning has always been that, like, I, I think predicting Oscars can be fun. We've done it on Cinemaholics before. But it doesn't age super well, and we, we're always wrong. <laughs> and even when we're right, it's like, who cares? But uh, I do like the idea of looking at these individual categories and doing our own little award show. Now, we already had a top film list that we did for the show not too long ago. Earlier in, this year in January, we did our top 10 films of 2019. So this isn't going to be a belabored dive through the year because we already did that. We've already talked about almost all of these films, but this is going to be a little bit more fun, a little bit more pomp and circumstance. And we will get to discuss a couple of films, a few films here and there that didn't make the main show, right? So the way it works is we are going to be looking at the categories as they were nominated, right? So we're not doing, we're not putting our own stuff in, We aren't writing in any candidates, anything like that. We are simply picking the winners from the official Oscar ballot. And we also streamlined the categories. So there are a few categories we're not going to get into because we don't want this to be another three-hour show, right? So we're just going to be doing some of the heavy hitters. And I think it's going to work out pretty well. Sam will... Before we do this, I guess we'll start with with you, Sam. What's your impression of this year's Oscar nominations? Are, are you happy with these picks? With uh, with what made it to the ballot? Uh, no happier than I've been in other such years. Um, although I was, I've been trying to see all the all the films nominated for uh, for all twenty four awards this year, of which there are fifty three total. I think I'm at like forty nine right now. Um, and I realized that a lot of my favorite movies of the year were not nominated for anything. So I guess that's not unlike any other year, but this is the first time I've really taken notice of it. So I really have to, I really have to put myself in the mind of an Academy voter to really see what they're getting at with this. But yeah, it could be, certainly could be a lot worse. Uh, look at last year. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Although I liked some of the picks last year, uh, if yeah. not, maybe not some of the winners from last year. But yeah, we still don't know how Oscars are going to turn out on Sunday. But uh, what about you, Will? Yeah, I got to echo a lot of what Sam said. I mean, like any year, there's a lot of movies that I'm glad we were nominated and a lot of movies that I was disappointed were nominated. And uh, I was disappointed that a lot of films didn't get recognized. But it's kind of the give and take of how it works. I mean, I think a lot of people have already pointed out that it's uh, another year where all male directors were nominated. And that's, you know, it's always disappointing in a certain respect. And different other things are annoying or frustrating for different reasons. But, um, I mean, as far as the nominees are concerned, I mean, I would say at least five of the movies nominated for Best Picture are really solid. So, you, I mean, five out of nine is not too bad. So, it's pretty good. As <laughs> yeah, far as five out of nine. Concerned. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I guess let's technically begin. six out of nine. So 
It's mm. higher than higher than half. All right. Well, the way the way it's going to start off is we're going to list out the nominees, and then we won't talk too much about all the individual nominees, just the ones that we will pick. We don't have uh, any envelopes, unfortunately, but um, yeah. Regardless, uh, we we will be doing this uh, in podcast form, and that should hopefully suffice. But all right, we're going to start with the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. Our nominees are Avengers Endgame, The Irishman, The Lion King, 1917, and Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Now, Best Visual Effects, for people who don't understand, this is really looking at the the best achievement in, on all things, um, like... I, I guess like sound is part of this, but mainly yeah, as as it would imply, like the visuals of a film, the overall production, the the artistry. Uh, a lot of Academy voters uh, take into account like whether or not you can get swept up in the illusion of the film through the visuals. So that's some of the criteria. None of that's official, obviously. And I think last year, First Man won this award. So. For 2019 slash 2020, um, Sam Noland, who wins in your book? So if I'm choosing the winner, if I have, if I'm being locked in that weird curtained booth that I like to imagine is is what the Academy runs on, um, and I'm being forced to check a box, if I'm looking at these nominees, honestly, regardless of the of the quality of the movies compared to the other two, I'm. I'm honestly thinking about going with the Lion King because the movie is one of the worst of the year. It is not, it is not good whatsoever, but uh, I believe that those lions were there. I believe that they were talking. It was weird that they were talking and it really ruined the movie, but I believed it. So it's, uh, I take no issue with the effects of that movie, if nothing else. Um, But also let's not forget that Avengers Endgame, like, there's a talking raccoon in that movie, and that's not even a point of contention. Like we just all <laughs> accept that 100, percent and there's nothing. There's not even any doubt as to whether or not that's real. It's like, yeah, there's a raccoon. Whatever. That's uh, uh, something that constantly amazes me about these Marvel movies, how they've gotten us swept up into the world. But honestly, I think, um, I think the Lion King would be my pick, as much as it pains me to give any sort of commending uh, compliments to that movie. All right. I was hoping you were going to switch to Avengers Endgame over the course of that uh, entire thing. But nevertheless, you get to pick the winner for you. So, Will Ashton, what about you? Who does the Academy Award go to? Well, I got to agree with a lot of what uh, Sam said, because even though I despise The Lion King, it's my least favorite movie of 2019. I can't really fault the visuals of it, with the exception of, obviously, having animals with no expressions. That was, I mean... (laughs) I think a big point of contention with it's the accurate. Itself. That's what yeah. that's what's terrible. That's what I mean. About so it. I mean, as far as what it tried to accomplish, which was being a realistic looking movie uh, based on the Lion King, the animated film. I guess they're both animated, but um, yeah. I mean, looking at the nominees, I mean, the Irishman. As much as I liked the film, the special effects were fairly wonky as far as the de aging was concerned. Um, Avengers, I thought was you know impressive, but I don't really think the visual effects were above and beyond what we expect from the Marvel movies at this point. Um, and then Star Wars. I mean, I don't. I would say something similar, but I don't know if um has any Star Wars movie won best visual effects in the past. I'm assuming the first one did. Hmm. Force Awakens. I, I don't other. think did. I think Mad Max Fury road probably beat it out but i don't know i know you're talking about the original trilogy but i I don't know if i don't think those won so i mean there's something i guess potentially you know like giving it to that film as far as like a like franchise but that's not really what we're talking about here so and i do i mean there's small touches in 1917 as far as the visual effects are concerned, that I found impressive. Like, there's a scene without getting into spoilers where a character is like dying on screen, and you believably, you know, see him like go pale. And I don't know if that's more the like the makeup or the visual effects, but that's very impressive. But I don't think it's enough to give it an Oscar. So, yeah, it's uh, not showy with its visual effects the way these other movies are. Sure. So. I guess for me, uh, despite uh, my ill feelings towards the film itself, I have to deal with The Lion King. (laughs) Okay, and I did look it up. A New Hope actually did win the Oscar for visual effects. So it has happened. That's what I figured. Yeah, Yeah, I figured that. 
was the case. So, yeah. But it says here, no Star Wars film has won an Academy Award since the original trilogy. So uh, that is uh, that that kind of makes sense. But still a little surprising. All right. If I am picking the winner for me, it is very easy. Uh, could, could not be easier. My pick is 1917, uh, because 1917 is the only one of these films where I thought the visual effects actually served the highest purpose that they can, which, as I sort of alluded before, was the it, it gave the illusion of me not just being in World War I, but also being in this stream of consciousness day where I, it feels like it's in real time. And it's not. And so what they were able to pull off with the visual effects in tandem with the stunt work, in tandem with how are they they were able to shoot everything, I think it's the most impressive. And it had the highest hill to climb compared to all the other nominees. I think that the, the Lion King has the benefit of it being a remake. The, the, a lot of the visual effects have been figured out before through the animation, so they didn't have to do that leg of it. They still worked very hard, of course. But I, I can't say that I think it's superior because it's not as a original. Same goes for Avengers Endgame on that same note and Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, the only contender, I think, with 1917 for me was The Irishman. And I just didn't think the execution was nearly as impressive. So I give the award to 1917. But you two outrank, outvote me on this one. So The Lion King <laughs> wins visual effects. Yeah, outrank, whatever. <laughs> um, so, so far we, we have one, I, and I, I don't think we're, this is going to happen too often where two of us agree on the same thing. Um, well, who knows though? I don't know, but let's move on to a similar ish category, although that might be superficial, the Academy Award for best cinematography. And this award obviously goes to the cinematographer, uh, the director of photography for each of these films. So definitely need to keep that in mind. Now, when we look at this award, we should keep in mind that, uh, well, first of all, Alfonso Cuaron won for Roma last year. I thought that that was certainly apt. And compared to visual effects, it's not about the flashiness of it. It's not about just the the practical or visual or you know computer-generated effects, anything like that. It, it's really about the overall look, feel, and mood of a film and how that serves the story. That That's one way to sum up uh, best cinematography, but uh, I guess you could you could you could describe it in a lot of different ways. So I don't want to limit it. But let's go through these nominees now. First up, we have The Irishman, and our cinematographer there is Rodrigo Prieto. Next, we have Joker, Lawrence Scher. Then we have The Lighthouse, Yaren Blachki, 1917, Roger Deakins, and finally, Once Upon a Time in dot 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 Hollywood, Robert Richardson. Starting with you, Sam. Who do you pick? This is definitely between uh, between either The Lighthouse or 1917 for me. Both of those really created a world that got me into a time and a place, uh, really swept me up into the, into the events of the movie. I liked 1917 more as a movie, so I'm inclined to go with that one. Um, but even regardless of that, I think that one does a more impressive job, kind of going in tandem with what you were saying, John, about how uh, it really replicated this experience and manifested it in the viewer in a way that the lighthouse didn't quite get there for me, uh, even though it is obviously gorgeous to look at. Uh, the black and white is second to none as far as I'm concerned in 2019. So by a hair, I'm going to go with 1917. All right. That's one for 1917. What say you, Will Ashton? Uh, I think this one's pretty easy. Uh, no respect or no disrespect to Roger Deakins, but it's easily the lighthouse for me as far as capturing the mood and aesthetic that the film is trying to achieve. I think the lighthouse is easily the one that uh, captures that in a way that I feel is very stylish and presentable in a very artistic, moody sort of way. And uh, I just think it looks pretty damn cool. And I would be pretty <laughs> happy to see A24 get at least a Oscar <laughs> at this year's ceremony. Um, but, you know, I mean... Nothing really against uh, the other nominees, with the exception of The Irishman, which I, to stress, I really like this movie, but we picked two categories where I find it a little lacking, being <laughs> visual effects and uh, cinematography. But uh, yeah, easily for me, it's a Lighthouse. All right. I, Lighthouse would be my second pick because I do agree with you, Will, on that film's just visual uh, aesthetic being so effective. But I'm going to have to go with Sam on this one. I would pick Yay. 1917. <laughs> uh, Roger Deakins is a genius cinematographer. And I do think the movie owes so much 
to it, just everything involved in the the color tone of it, the the way the camera moves, and some of some of these effects that they managed to pull off. I mean, it's just perfect sync. I think between the the filmmaking and what they were trying to achieve with this this entire palette. Uh, it really is like some old school filmmaking married with the cutting edge technology of today. And I think Roger Deakins is just a, a true master. And so I think he really deserves this. Although uh, the lighthouse, I agree that a 24, it would be fantastic to have them. And, and I do want to give a little shout out to once upon a time in Hollywood for some of the, I would give maybe uh, I was leaning more toward production design for once upon a time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. We're not going to get to that category, unfortunately, but that's just a little tease because I think that they really do nail uh, the 1969 in that film and production design yeah. is part of it. So, but for this category, it looks like 1917 is the winner. All right, let's move on to foreign language film. This is a good one. And foreign language film, the nominees include Corpus Christi, which came out in Poland. That was their submission. Honeyland, which comes to us from North Macedonia, Macedonia. Les Miserables from France, which should be Portrait of a Lady on Fire, but regardless, Pain and Glory, <laughs> Spain, and Parasite, South Korea. Starting with you, Sam, who is your, or what is your pick for foreign language film? Now, this, this is an interesting sort of dilemma here, because this is the exact same thing that happened last year with Roma, where a nominee for international film or foreign language film, as it was known uh, at the time, is also a nominee for best picture. So that always kind of weirded me out how doesn't that automatically make it the best one that it was the only one for uh, only one nominated for like the best picture overall. Um, And hey, we should say too, same deal uh, for Honeyland because that got nominated for best documentary and best foreign language film. So yeah, yeah, very similar. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we've got a couple of nominees here that are nominated in more than one category. So Pain and Glory has uh, two nominations as well. Um, I have not seen Corpus Christi. I should I should uh, say that disclaimer. I have not. It's not playing in theaters anywhere, nor is it on streaming. So uh, looks like I'm going to have to sort of dip out of that one. Um, but I have seen the other four and I actually I like all of them. Uh, they're all really solid. In fact, I think Honeyland is the least of them. And even that is really engaging. Uh so I'm going to do so I'm going to be a little a little mischievous here. I'm not going to pick my favorite, which you can probably guess, but I'm going to go with uh Pain and Glory because I think that would be really neat to see uh this movie win an Oscar and Alma Dobar film no less. Um mm-hmm. and uh, cuz I imagine it's probably going to suffer in that other category it's nominated in. I don't know, but that's just my prediction. So uh and I really love Pain and Glory. So that's my pick. For, with an asterisk for this award. All right, Sam's playing some mind games. I love it. Will Ashton, <laughs> you're up. Yeah, I mean, I got to stress as well that I haven't seen three of the five nominees. Um, I know Honeyland is on Hulu. I just haven't had a chance to see it. Uh, and likewise, Corpus Christi and Les Miserables has not played in my area. And it's not available on streaming, so I haven't had a chance to see it. So ultimately, I had to pick between Pain and Glory and Parasite. And that's tough because I really like both movies quite a lot. They're easily in my top 20 for the year. Um, I guess I didn't tell you guys that Parasite has moved up into my top 10 since we did our episode. So mm. there is that. Um, but yeah, of the, the two I've seen, which I mean, again, like I guess that kind of disqualifies what I have to say. I still have to go with ultimately Parasite. Uh, just because I think it's a really solid, well-rounded film. And uh, I think you guys uh, already have sung its praises well enough. So that's uh, my pick. But no disrespect wow. to Pain Glory. All right. This this is tough because uh, I, I, I really, really do feel tempted to to just give this to Pain and Glory, if only because I just love this film so much and I wish that it was getting a lot more love. But I have to be true. Yeah. In this case, although that's not to say I won't play some games later. That said, I think that if they were a little bit closer, like if Parasite was not my number two film of the year and Pain and Glory was more like my number 20, I would feel a little bit better about giving it to Pain and Glory just out of like spreading the love around. But I do have to give it to Parasite because it just happens to be easily one of the best films of the year. And so there you go. Uh, Not really close for me either. So Parasite... We're we're super basic, obviously, um, here on Symbolics. I, I guess that is the the popular opinion at this point, but uh, I think deservedly so. So yeah, Parasite for this, wins. for this category, at least. I'm surprised so far, guys. Uh, so far, at least two people have voted on the same thing. Could that change 
with best documentary. I don't know. Let's move on. It could. Uh, if I may, John, I just want to say just a real quick point. I have also seen Les Robs. It's really good. I have not seen Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I've heard nothing but great things. Huh. But that is like, see it if you can. It's really important. I've really heard good, it's so. not good. So I now have yeah, to see it. Kind of <laughs> I've heard huh. pretty mixed things so far. Weird. Okay. Well, they're all. Mm-hmm. everyone's wrong. It's good. <laughs> I believe it. Okay. Everyone's wrong. I mean, I heard mixed things. So, <laughs> so I mean, what was Half that of mean? everyone is wrong. Perfect. All right, best documentary feature. I always love this category, especially because it always uh, reveals new films to me. I, I don't think I've ever seen all the documentaries that have been nominated before they're announced. And that's the case this year as well. So let's do this one. Starting with you, Sam, the nominees are American Factory, The Cave, The Edge of Democracy, For Sama, and Honeyland. What is your pick? Hmm. Uh, I have seen three of these. I've not seen American Factory or The Cave, both of which I plan to check out by uh, Sunday's ceremony. Just haven't gotten to them yet. So for me, as much as I like Honeyland, like I said earlier, um, it's between the edge of democracy and Fursama for me. Uh, Fursama, which I was lucky enough to get to see in a theater, it really grabbed me by the throat from moment one uh, and showed me a world that... I knew next to nothing about, uh, maybe to my own detriment, but really, really uh, just just got me from moment one and did not let go until the very end. And it was uh, not easy to get through. Also, it's uh, kind of a kind of a bleak, uh, gloomy vision of the world, but it's really effective in that way. That is what it sets out to do. Uh, I feel the same way about the edge of democracy, um, although I feel like it's a little. It, it's it's a little too fixated on a world uh, that I am not intricately familiar with for me to give that the edge. So I think also by a hair, I'm going to go with Fursama, but make no mistake, uh, Edge of Democracy is worth watching. It is on Netflix, so you have no excuse. Watch it. <laughs> well, so is American Factory, but all right. That's true. Will Ashen, what if you picked the winner? Who would it be? Uh, I've seen zero of the five nominees, so I abstain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So that's an absent from Will Ashton. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the only one I've seen, which is American Factory. Oh, John. I know. I, I didn't have time to catch the documentary features this year. I thought I was going to. I have. I still have Honeyland queued up and ready to go, and I haven't gotten to it yet. And uh, you're right. I have no excuse for missing the edge of democracy, and I missed my chance to see for Sama. For shame mm. is what we should say. So Fair enough. Uh, I happen to know the cave is on iTunes. So if if you're wondering where to get that, I don't know about the rest, but that's where you can find the cave if you're curious. So Sam, yours was the Edge of Democracy, correct? Correct. And so no, it was uh, for Sama. Oh, sorry, you said for Sama. So yes. because it was close though, because you saw more of the documentaries than I did, um, we're gonna say that for this category, uh, the winner is the one that you picked, which is for. I Sama. love how we're singling out a winner for this hypothetical world in which the three of us live. It's really important to me that we do that that way. It is. I, I can tell. <laughs> All right. Well, that is Best Documentary. Uh, I think we're going to get into some categories where we have seen most of the nominees, if not all of them, and that is Animated Feature. This is always my little pet favorite one. I'm always, I'm always mm. in love with the films that make it to Animated Feature. It's always so unpredictable. And this year is absolutely no exception. We'll start with How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, I Lost My Body, Klaus, Missing Link, and Toy Story 4. Sam Noland, if you picked the winner, yes. which of these animated tales would get the gold? If I pick the winner out of these five nominees, all of which I've seen, uh, it's no contest. It's going to Klaus. This the the word instant classic or the phrase instant classic uh, is kind of bandied about throughout the year. Uh, this is one in which it definitely applies. I can already see this like really cementing itself into a legacy of being that really great Christmas movie that was dropped uneventfully onto Netflix uh, in in mid November 2019 and only through word of mouth really escalated and grew into the into the juggernaut that it's proven to be. And I hope that momentum continues. Uh, to the actual award ceremony because this is really solid although uh, I lost my body and Toy Story 4 are also quite good Uh, but it's no contest Klaus all right Klaus is your pick 
What about you, Will? I don't think you've seen Klaus, so uh, I wonder what it could be. Um, yeah, I haven't seen Klaus, and I haven't seen I Lost My Body. Uh, but I'll take you guys' word for it. I'll pick uh, Klaus. Oh, Wait, what? Interesting. <laughs> That's not how it works, <laughs> but all right. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's funny because there aren't that many Christmas movies that have been nominated for Oscars, and I think the only animated one that's even close to being like a Christmas movie was Nightmare Before Christmas. And yeah. uh, I don't. I think that was only nominated. I don't think that won what it was nominated for. Like animated feature, I don't think it existed at the time. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that it was. was I think it was nominated yet. for it something was probably like, visual uh, effects or something, right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, like Wonderful Life, Miracle Thirty Fourth Street, Christmas Carol. Like we we've had some Christmas movies, but it doesn't happen as often. Uh, we should say. Uh, Fred but for Claus. me. <laughs> 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 Elves. Have you ever heard of that movie? It's the Santa Claus weird. Three, the Escape Clause. Yeah. There you <laughs> best, go. Best best supporting actor is what that got for yeah. Four Christmases. <laughs> uh yeah, Last Santa Christmas, two. John? How about that? <laughs> well, if I picked the winner, uh, I'm right there with you, Sam. I would pick Klaus, uh, for all the reasons you said. It, it really is the best animated film the animation is easily the most artistically successful uh it's a wonderfully hand-drawn film it harkens back to traditionally like painstakingly animation type films that we just don't see anymore uh nothing nothing against computer animated films but just the artistry behind this film is just undeniable and it just happens to be perfectly in tune with what this film's going for in its narrative uh, for me, it's really close, though, because I really loved I Lost My Body. And so that, that comes pretty close as well. The, o- the other films, Missing yeah. Link, it's, it's fine. How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, fine but kind of forgettable. Mm. And Toy Story 4, certainly a, a wonderful film to watch and kind of forget about over time. It, it, and yeah. it, <laughs> Toy Story 4 does get a little bit of goodwill with me because the animation is – the computer animation is so incredible. But it's not even the yeah. best animation we've seen from Pixar – so, yeah. I mean, maybe in some ways, but I'd say overall that that belongs to a couple other films that just kind of blow Toy Story 4 out of the water if you just put everything together in a bowl. So for me, it's Klaus, no question. And, and Will, I just hope you watch the film. I, I hope our, your expectations haven't <laughs> shot too high into the stratosphere at this point. Yeah. I do plan to see it, hopefully before the Sunday, but... Yeah, I definitely have high expectations, maybe higher than both of you guys did when you saw it. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, Klaus and I Lost My Body, both on Netflix. Right. Yep. Yes, thanks for reminding listeners, of course. All right, and and I think Missing Link is on something like Hulu or Amazon Prime. It's it's available as well. Yeah. And Toy Story 4, I don't think is on Disney+, Plus, but it could be. I forget. All right, I'm, I'm definitely not very helpful. All right, let's move on <laughs> to original song. Uh, this, this is a good one. I, I hope you all listen to all of these songs. It would not have taken <laughs> that long. And th- this is an interesting category because I think, in my opinion, this is probably the weakest original song yeah. uh, we've ever gotten. And I, I don't say that lightly, but starting with you, Sam. Uh, I mean, 2016 was pretty... 2016 or 2015, the year with the Fifty Shades of Grey song was pretty weak. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was 2016, but, but it was the 2015 film, I think, you're right. But I think those but those picks might have actually been stronger, because was that the year with the Lady Gaga song? Mm, it could be. I Which Lady Gaga song was it? I have stars It was stars the one for the documentary. It wasn't, it wasn't Shallow. It was uh, the other one yeah. that she was... That we would have to to dig back into the archives, but Sam, yeah. of of these original songs, which one suits your musical fancy? Oh goodness! Uh, oh, I forgot to go through the nominees. Let's do that. Okay, yeah, yeah. let's go through the nominees for best original song. First up, I can't let you throw yourself away from Toy Story Four, composed by Randy Newman, which is nonsense because the best song on there is the Ballad of a Lonesome Cowboy, and if that was nominated, yes. that would have won. And then uh, we have I'm gonna love me again. From Rocket Man, which has Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Uh, that uh, that could be a winner, maybe. I'm Standing With You yeah. from Breakthrough. Diane Warren. Okay. Into the <laughs> Unknown from Frozen 2. Chris and Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, who, of course, worked on the first Frozen's music. And last, we have Stand Up, which is from Harriet. And that is Joshua Bryan, Campbell, and Cynthia Erivo. Sam Noland, yeah. who do you pick? 
Uh, this is a very, uh, very difficult one. Not because I love a few of them equally, but because I'm struggling to remember most of them. Uh, and it would like imagining any of these winning is kind of unusual. The thing with the Rocket Man song is that it's an Elton John song in the Elton John movie. So it didn't even occur to me until it was nominated for this award that it was an original song that didn't already exist. Because the rest of that movie soundtrack is uh, just laced with Elton John classics. So I just assumed this was one I didn't know about. Uh, so that one's a little strange. Um, the the sappy breakthrough song i almost hope that wins just to see breakthrough get an oscar and everyone be like oh what the, what the hell is this breakthrough movie and then and then bear witness to it um <laughs> but honestly if i'm thinking if i'm visualizing because what they do with the original song if you watch the awards in the past you know this is they perform all five of them over the course of the ceremony so I'm imagining, I'm playing back in my head what I know from this, uh, from the songs, I should say. And I'm between Into the Unknown and Stand Up. I think, um, Stand Up is kind of the more obvious Oscar-y one, whereas Into the Unknown is really the more, the more popular one. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it some love and I'm gonna say I would, I would like to see, uh, Stand Up from Harriet get an award because that would be neat, wouldn't it? Well, if it does win, that doesn't mean Cynthia Ervo becomes an EGOT. That's correct. Yeah. So I guess that's something. Yeah. All right. Well, Ashton, are you going to support Cynthia Erivo's EGOT chances? <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to go with Randy Newman's I Can't Let You Throw Yourself Away, just because that's the one I remember the most. And um, also, I, I think it's just nice to have a catchy song about not committing suicide. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yeah. Um yeah, I mean this I I don't know. I just I don't really remember the Ellen John song well and I don't really remember the breakthrough song well. I mean I listened back to these and I just don't remember them, <laughs> which is a good sign. In the Unknown, I remember the melody more than I remember the lyrics or anything particular with the song itself. And then Stand Up, you know, I I think it's it's fine, you know, it's a pretty good song, but if I had to choose, I would pick I can't let yourself th- I can't let you throw yourself away. Just because I want Randy Newman gets a love because he's probably not going to win for best score. So, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see him win Oscar. Although I think he's already won at least a couple. So he's fine. All right. This, this is a little bit tough for me because I can't say I love any of these songs. I barely like two of them. And it comes <laughs> close to me for uh, I'm going to love me again. I do think it is a bit of a forgettable song. You're right. Uh, but when I when I have to do my pick, I, see here's the thing with Into the Unknown. You're right, I can remember the melodies so easily, but a I have a hard time justifying Frozen Two getting an Academy Award and Toy Story Four not, <laughs> um, because the gap in quality is so distant. And mm. I have to agree when I listen back to these, the only one that I added to my music library was I can't let you throw yourself away from Toy Story Four. As angry as I am. <laughs> That it Ballad of a Lonesome Cowboys, because I've had that song in my music library since the movie came out. I listen to it oh, yeah. pretty regularly. It's very good. And it just, just baffles me. that. Uh, and I don't even like country music. I'm not like a big Chris Stapleton fan, but it's fantastic. And regardless, um, I can't let you throw yourself away. You'll love to see it. And I guess that gets our collective pick at this point. Sure. So that's original song. Let's move on to original score. Our nominees are Joker, Hilder, Guanazatir, doubt I am pronouncing that even close to correctly. And then we have Little Women. The composer was Alexandre Despla. Marriage Story, again, Randy Newman. 1917, Thomas Newman. Oh, a little bit of a family rivalry, perhaps. And then Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, John (laughs) Williams. We'll start with you, Sam. Yeah. Who is your pick for original score? Got a lot of the usual suspects here. Uh, at least four of them have been nominated for multiple awards in the past. Um, if I'm looking at the list of these, uh, these the three that I'm sort of narrowing it down to uh, sort of sort of differ in quality. But when I think of what was the score that a I remember most, uh, b that was most effective in the moment, uh, and c just really just really fit well with the movie uh overall when it comes to uh fitting in with that machinery that was the rest of the film uh i'm narrowing it down to 1917 
Little Women and Joker. Uh, as much as I think that Joker's really flawed, uh, the score is actually really effective, and it made for some some of the better moments in the movie uh, that I can single out. Um, Little Women is one of those scores that is kind of, uh, what's the word, kind of doesn't really make a huge deal out of itself in the best possible way. It really complements the events on screen without without drawing uh, too much attention. So that's always impressive to see a composer be able to do that, which Alexander Desplat does a lot. Uh, but really, and maybe this is just slight uh, recency bias, it also happens to be my favorite of the of the five. Um, I still think of the the score from 1917 and get like shivers down my spine. It's still playing at the theater I work at, and I will purposely sneak into the theaters during certain scenes just to see just to see certain sequences again and hear the music go along with it. So that is what I am gonna end up going with is Thomas Newman 1917. Uh, All right, one for 1917. Will Ashen, open up your envelope. What's the winner? I thought we didn't have envelopes. <laughs> it's virtual, right? So sure. oh, let's play along. You gotta commit yeah. to your bits here, John. <laughs> um I'm between Little Women and Marriage Story. Um I agree with what you said, Sam. I, I, I did appreciate the score for Joker. Um I did think that it elevated a lot of the scenes for me and um I do think it's probably gonna win, but who knows. Um yeah. but I also found it maybe a little too repetitive for its own good. And I do think, you know, like everything in the movie was maybe like a pitch too loud. <laughs> <laughs> for its own good but i mean it was effective for what i was going for and i certainly enjoyed it um i really don't know why john williams is nominated here probably just a lifetime achievement award <laughs> um, essentially yeah um and i like the, the score for 1917 though i i don't remember as well as i anticipated i would have so um hmm. i guess i'll go you know i i, I want to support good old uh randy newman and I, I really did enjoy the score for Marriage Story, and I don't think it's going to get a lot of love at the Oscars. And I, I do think it's a great score. As much as I like the one for Little Women, uh, I think I'm going to go with Marriage Story for this category. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, this is a tough one for me as well, because if we were talking best soundtrack, I think I would actually go with Joker, surprisingly enough. But as far as the composition goes, that one was mostly forgettable for me, even though I, I, I recognize it's objectively good. And then with Little Women, I... The, the score did not register with me. Uh, same with Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. And if a Star Wars movie isn't able to register the score with me, that is not a sign of good things. Although the, the things that did register with me for that were just callbacks to the original score. So I don't see it. Right. That's not original, right? Like none of the original mm -hmm. compositions uh, struck a chord so to speak. So for me, it's between Marriage Story and 1917, two scores that really couldn't be any more different. And I struggled <laughs> with this because the the Marriage Story score, that really got a reaction out of me. That final scene where you can just tell that this is the same score from Toy Story 3 is so effective. And the, throughout the entire movie, the music is just so good at like outlining the irony of certain situations i think when he's walking his son for second halloween for example uh, and with 1917 I, that score comes pretty close because i do think it's tremendous and sam you're right it just sticks in your head and it's so like sh the shivers down the spine is apt but i i'm gonna go with a marriage story and say randy newman gets two oscars if i'm picking the winner because i think that one is just uh, it's doing something a little bit more challenging and it's it doesn't have the the trappings of war to sort of like hide the imperfections of the musical notes it has to actually do a lot of work the score it has to add levity to a movie that is making you a little emotionally angry and tired <laughs> and the movie kind of lifts you up and i think all the work it's doing should be rewarded so i go with marriage story which means marriage story will and i have agreed twice in a row gets original score for us yeah uh. All right, next up, we have the Academy Award for Best Film Editing. And last year, I think, was it Bohemian Rhapsody that won last year? It sure was, wasn't it? Yeah, for it? some yeah. goddamn reason. I do actually think the film editing in Bohemian Rhapsody is strong, but I'm an outlier when it comes to that. Uh, anyway. Who and his. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I revel in my contrarian take there. But <laughs> it, it did fall in line with, uh, with the Oscar voters, which is nothing to brag about. So... Yeah. Our nominees for film editing this year are Ford vs. Ferrari, The Irishman, Jojo Rabbit, Joker, and Parasite. Sam Noland, who do you pick out yeah. of this very eclectic bunch? 
It is an eclectic bunch, and of the five, there are three that stand out to me as when I go back and visit revisit it in my mind, I say the editing was uh, was rather impressive, and those are The Irishman, Jojo Rabbit, and Parasite, the latter two of which I have now seen three times each and are, and are two of my favorite movies of the year. Uh, so I'm going to... I'm going to sort of just right off the bat, I'm going to say Irishman, like two thumbs up to the editing really does a good, uh, does a good work in cutting back and forth between the time periods, um, and between different, uh, sequences of events. Um, but that is, I'm going to have to, to just sort of put that to the side for now. Um, Jojo Rabbit is really effective in the way that it uses the editing to show, uh, to sort of reflect the journey of the main character. Uh, so I think that is not worth neglecting whatsoever, but parasite is just so enrapturing from moment to moment. And that is thanks in no small part to the editing. Uh, the editor's name, by the way, is Yang Jin Mo for that one. And I think it's, it's, it's a no brainer. It's got to go to parasite. It's a, they're not the first award that I'm going to give parasite to, uh, or at the first of many, I should say, but yeah, that's, that's my pick. No doubt about it. All right. So parasite for Sam Noland. What say you Ash? I agree that there are three films here that I'm looking at in particular, though. I don't quite agree with the three films uh, that Sam picked. Well, I agree with two. I just don't agree with one. Uh, for me, it's between the Irishman parasite and Ford V Ferrari. Um, I think, as Sam said, I mean, the pacing of The Irishman, keeping it to be a fairly contemplative, meditative film, while also moving at a really good clip, especially for a three and a half hour film, shouldn't be neglected. And I think that's uh, another testament to Thel- Thelma Shoemaker's brilliance as an editor. Yep. Um, I, As much as I like the editing in that film, though, I don't think I'd pick it um, just because I don't think it quite stands out uh, as much as Parasite for me, where I think the editing in that film really uh, complements the structure of the film and everything that it accomplishes as far as uh, capturing its tone and story elements. And I think that's uh, it's editing that's not as flashy as I think some people want in this category, but I definitely think what it communicates as far as capturing everything that Bong Joon-ho is doing in that film is really stellar. But I do want to give special notice to 4V Ferrari just for how it is is able to be a really smooth uh just very well compact film as far as you know not a film i particularly loved or admired but i definitely think especially in the racing scenes the way those scenes are put together is really impressive and i do want to give special notice to how much the editing in joker does ratchet up the tension and keep you in this kind of building dread and the less i say about jojo rabbit the better yeah okay i uh (laughs) you took the words out of my mouth when it came to ford versus ferrari for me it came down to that and parasite um honestly jojo rabbit as much as i really enjoy that film i do think the film editing is some of its weaker components and i think some of the the flourishes in terms of how that film evolves over time as the child in the movie evolves over time i don't really credit to the editing as much so uh, it's not something that stands out to me when it comes to editing. Irishman, I think Irishman and Joker, I think the editing are two of the biggest problems in that in those films. So I think it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous to see these ones nominated, in my opinion. So yeah, again, Ford versus Ferrari and Parasite, and you said it perfectly, Will. I just think the racing scenes in Ford versus Ferrari are just expertly crafted, and they really are technologically well done. I think James Mangold had a, a large hand in the editing as well and you can you can really tell he's in control he's behind the steering wheel of that movie the whole way through however Ah. i think this is our first unanimous oscar because i think it's parasite it has to be parasite Uh, this film's not true we all agreed on klaus remember that john well of all the films we actually saw though come on fair enough i don't really count that one but yeah one where we all wholeheartedly agree on on the the choice and it's not there's no caveats and i think it's because this film's editing is part of what makes it so i think universally beloved by people uh you just are so sucked into this world the entire way through and the editing is almost you're right well it's not flashy but that serves its favor because the fact that you don't notice it is what makes it good. I think yeah. a film I would have nominated in this category is actually 1917. You can at me all day, but 1917's <laughs> editing is brilliant because you can't tell it's being, you're watching something that's so painstakingly edited. Editing 
yes, a lot of it is post-production. Yes, a lot of it is like, okay, this scene cuts to this scene. But a huge, huge process in editing, it goes into pre-production. It goes into script doctoring. It goes into planning out your staging and the blocking. And when it comes to that, I think Parasite has no peer in this category this year. So Parasite well, I was is going to say, I us. mean, if we're just going to name movies that we wish were nominated, I think I Cut Gems being left out for editing is pretty egregious. But ah, that's well, that is worth a mention. Yeah. All right. So that's film editing. And let's we'll, let's real quickly. The, the shorts are have been a contentious one because Will and I haven't seen a lot of them. And uh, we, we don't want to belabor this too much because we know a lot of you I mean, listeners seen haven't them, seen a lot of these shorts. I said a lot of them. Um, if we're, sure. You said across like all three of the categories, right? Sure. I mean, I haven't seen any of the documentary shorts, as we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah. So, so Sam, you have seen a lot of the shorts, I think, or if not all of them. Uh, what, what were yeah. your picks for, if we could just go through them quickly, your picks for animated shorts, uh, live action, and documentary? Uh, starting with animated, the one that usually gets the most play, because uh, they're a lot of times animated shorts are the most readily available. Um, there are a, a pretty good crop this year. Uh, I think the only one that I didn't really care for is uh, Daughter, um, which is really stylish and uh, visually striking, but just has no real, just has no hooks to sink into the viewer's uh, enjoyment glands and reel them in. So that one does, I saw it like literally last night. I've already forgotten almost everything about it. Uh, But the other four are really good. And the one that I'm still thinking about, granted it's only a day later, but more than any of the others is um, Sister by uh, Siki Song. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, which is really elegant. It just shows it uh, shows through narration. Here's the story of when my younger sister came into my life. We did this, we did that, and then it ends and rips your heart to shreds and really, uh, really incites a lot of anger for something that would kind of would kind of give it away the twist ending and it's hard to spoil a short but this is one that really uh really has a gut punch ending so i want to preserve that as much as possible uh it's one of my favorite things that's nominated regardless of short or feature length this is way up there so i love sister i hope that one wins uh live action short i think a little bit more of a variety of uh, of quality here. I think easily the worst of any of the 15 shorts nominated is Brotherhood, one of the live action shorts. Couldn't tell you almost anything about what it's about. It went in one eye and out the other, if that's even anatomically possible. <laughs> and it's it made no impression on me whatsoever. The other four are interesting because um, uh, we have another one. Weirdly enough, we have the one I just mentioned, the animated short is called Sister. One of the uh, live action shorts that's animated is called a sister so a little more yeah. a little more definite with the article there <laughs> that sister um, got much better grades <laughs> yeah mm. and that one um if you saw the animated shorts last year i cannot recall the title off the top of my head but it's the one where uh the woman is on the phone with her son who's like stranded in the woods and she's trying oh, to figure mother. out mother mother that's what it was yeah it's kind of it has a similar vibe in the way that it like starts and gets really intense immediately uh to give just a quick synopsis there's a 911 operator and she gets a call from a woman who's saying like really strange things and then she quickly starts to realize that the woman on the phone is in the process of being kidnapped and is pretending to be on the phone with her sister and she's trying to play along and figure out what like how she can help and it's really really tense and it and it's uh just a joy to watch and a really, really tight example of uh, how to do a short film and really reel the viewer in immediately. Um, and I think, honestly, that like now that I say it, I, I didn't even consider which one, but that one is my favorite. I think it's really effective. It does what it does the best. Uh, and I know that it might it, it's kind of superficial, but it does have a melancholy element to it that has really stuck with me so i'm gonna go with a sister for this one uh but i also don't want to gloss over the other two the other three because uh nefta football club is last year the animated live action shorts or animated live action the live action shorts 
were were singled out as almost all having to do with kids in danger or being murdered and it was really depressing to watch them all in a row and this one looks like it's gonna go that way and when it doesn't it's really pleasant and it's just this incidental uh just sort of just sort of fun time in what you might guess from the synopsis is uh would be would be tense and uh and uh you know, engaging in a really, in a really realistic way, like wondering, oh, what's going to happen? So that one's neat. Um, I know that, I know that Will has some strong feelings on the neighbor's window, which is really immature and stupid. (laughs) Yes, to say the least. (laughs) Yeah. The neighbor's window is, uh, is kind of like this rear window riff, um, except instead of having anything to do with a murder or like an investigation it's just sort of looking at your neighbors and making incidental quaint musings about how life is passing you by and then it kind of ends in this really maudlin way that doesn't work at all and it's almost laughable it no it is laughable uh it ends in the most cliched fashion possible (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like literally the most cliched way you can end this thing. It like yeah. it blew my mind that it actually chose to end this way. <laughs> yeah. I will I will argue for a half second that the point it's trying to get across in the last I'm not even kidding 15 seconds is not a bad point to make. They chose the wrong way. It just it just it I was amazed to find out that the director of this was not like in their 20s because this is really just just infantile Mm -hmm. uh philosophical musings on suburban life and it's really i recommend watching it just because of how inept it is honestly not suburban life more city life but yeah i agree yeah that's what i meant to say yeah it's just that upper class mentality of just like i don't know it it just it just feels so pompous and masturbatory and the acting is terrible it's bad, yeah. Acting. It's really. I mean, bad. the wife's like fine. Like the, she's okay. The, the she's husband okay. Yeah, think, is horrendous. Yeah, the husband's not very good. I could not believe that they they were okay. And with the neighbors and the neighbors worse. The the wife of the neighbor is just really bad. Yeah, I feel. I just. I don't. I generally don't know how this got nominated. I don't. I don't know either. Maybe they just. It was like the last one, and they had to nominate something. So who knows? I just, it makes me wonder what the other contenders were. Um, uh, the, I'm sure that we could probably track down the short list, but that's, there's a time and a place for that. Sure. And the last live the action short, short list. Just real quick. Ah, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> the uh, uh, short list of uh, shorts. Yes. Um, the last uh, live action short film, just real quick, I want to mention is about an orphanage in Guatemala, and it's it's really effective. It's really powerful. It it wasn't it wasn't grasping me. It wasn't getting me. Uh, and then like right at the end. Uh, I was like, oh, wow, that was good. Like, it sort of, it ended and then became good. I can't, I can't describe any more without saying that, but uh, check that one out because that's, uh, th- it's really informative and really powerful. And then finally, the documentary shorts, um, which are quite long, usually, in comparison to the uh, animated and live action shorts. So I won't go into detail on each one, but the two that I want to give a special shout out to are... In the Absence, which is uh, a document a documentary about a true story that happened in April 2014, if memory serves. But regardless, there was this uh, ferry, a boat, that sailed off the coast of Korea to go to an island. And it was part of like a school trip. Like there were a couple of hundred students on this boat. And then suddenly, for a, for reasons that they really didn't go into detail on, but that are kind of incidental, the boat starts to sink, and it's really perilous. And as you go on, as the movie goes on, in uh, not necessarily real time, but in sequential order, you start to realize just how little the powers that be uh, give a damn. In a way that was that was causing like a verbal reaction in the crowd I was watching. Like they were getting frustrated watching this for the victims on the boat that ended up sinking and taking quite a few lives. Like like upwards of two hundred and fifty some lives were lost just because uh, no one did anything and uh, just really overlooked this tragic situation. So that is it's depressing, it's somber. 
uh, and it's not it's not going to put you in a good mood, but it's really worth watching because of uh, just how rousing it is and not in a way that's inspiring it's it's meant to make you angry and it does and i think it's worth commending for that uh so that is my pick for for a documentary short but the other one that came very close to winning uh was st louis superman which is about a legislator in missouri bruce franks who's uh, a battle rapper and was and has been affected in ways that I can't even comprehend by gun violence. Lost his uh, older brother to it, or maybe younger brother. No, it was older. Older brother to it in uh, the early 90s and has never fully recovered from it and wants to build a better future. And it's really inspiring to see him do everything he can to do that. So uh, I would I will say all four, all five of the documentary shorts are uh, are certainly worth watching. So if there's still time, if it's playing in theaters, uh, it's a bit of a long haul to see all five of them because it's 160 minutes total, but they're all worth seeing. And so I would recommend doing that if you have the means and, of course, the time. But yeah, In the Absence is my pick for that one. And thus, those are the shorts. Glad I could get a chance to touch on those for a little bit. Thank you so much, Sam. So your animated short was Sister, correct? Correct. And yeah. best live action short was <laughs> A Sister, correct? Yeah, I didn't even realize that. but that So those are Sister, my Sister, <laughs> glad to be with you. Yeah. Um, and then In the Absence. All right. In the Absence. So those are three categories for the price of Sam. Let's yeah. go into the screenplay. Uh, just for kicks and giggles, Sam, I'll, I'll say that my pick, from what I've seen of the live action, uh, were Nefta Football Club and Hair yeah, Love. That's a good one. Both good. Hair Love would be my pick for animated, but all right. For adapted screenplay. So this is always a fun one. So adapted screenplay, in case you're unfamiliar. So this was not a screenplay that was based originally or written originally for the film. It can come from a book or some kind of source material, uh, something that predates the actual film. So in that case, uh, the films that are up for nomination here are The Irishman from Steve's, Steve Zalian. And so he adapted this from I Heard You Paint Houses. Jojo Rabbit from Taika Waititi, he adopted this from a novel. Joker from Todd Phillips and Scott Silver, which I think he's basing this off of The Killing Joke, I guess, but this doesn't really have anything to do with any Joker things that I'm aware of, honestly. Well, it's based on pre-existing characters. So that's right. Yeah. yeah, but it, yeah, it's in that sense, it's not really adapted from Look, something... Adapted, adapted screenplay gets really weird. Yeah, Blast this is a Lucy Goosey best- one. Yeah, <laughs> Whiplash was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay because there's a short film that was taken right. from its original screenplay and turned into a short film, and then that short film funded the movie, so it became an adapted screen. It just gets weird. Which I actually it's, think yeah. makes way more sense than with Joker, but whatever. Uh, and then uh, Little Women, sense, but we can uh, Greta Gerwig obviously adapted that from Louisa May Alcott, and The Two Popes, Anthony McCartan, and he had, I, I'm not sure what he adapted this from because he did write the screenplay, I guess play, it was- right? Oh, you're right. Yeah, it was a play, wasn't it? Huh. Um, yeah, the, Pope the Pope is the name of that play. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, totally skipped my mind. Um, so there you go. Adapted screenplay, Sam Noland, what is your pick? Yeah. Uh, so I I had a little bit of a tough time with this one because much to my dismay, uh, or I guess sort of uh, including Joker, but there's only one of them that I've, I've actually read the uh, source material um, I know a lot about the Joker stuff, but this is, it doesn't have Batman in it. So it's not any Joker story I can recognize off the top of my head. Uh, and I have read Little Women. I read that in high school uh, and enjoyed it quite a bit. So kind of just by default, uh, that's the one I'm going to go with. But I do not want to, I do not want to uh, gloss over the Irishman because I read before seeing the movie, I read a lot of, I read up a lot on uh on uh, frank sheeran and jimmy hoffa and it it seemed like a really solid adaptation so i have not read the actual book i heard you paint houses but i do i want to give that a little shout out because i haven't given a lot of love i do like the irishman i think it's quite good uh but little women is gonna be my pick for that because uh, greta gerwig isn't isn't getting anything else this year so that's uh that would be a shame for her not to get that all right there you go for little women for sam what about, oh man, that was a terrible way to phrase that. 
And uh, Will Ashen, what was your pick? Uh, yeah, I, I'm between The Irishman and Little Women as well. Although I do want to stress that I think the screenplay for Two Popes is really solid. And kind of underrated, even though it's nominated for <laughs> Best uh, Adapted Screenplay. Um, I think the screenplays for Joker is not and Jojo Rabbit are not very good. Um, yeah. But I'm not going to dive into that right now. So um, of the two I picked, I mean, part of me wants to give it to The Irishman just for given the length and the scope of it and the just the sheer volume of it um as far as telling that story in a fairly compact and comprehensive way but i think as far as celebrating the art of adaption and also making a screenplay that uh honors the themes of the story while also talking about the filmmaker's personal life in a way that feels nevertheless pretty timeless and universal uh i think there's a lot to admire in the screenplay from Greta Gerwig's Little Women and i think as much as i like the Irishman screenplay i might have to give her the advantage for this all right. Wow. So two for the little women. What will John pick? Well, let's find out. Uh, Only one way. Let's find out. <laughs> well, just like you two, The Irishman definitely was well considered by me because I think that it is worth pointing out. It's it's a very hard book to adapt because of the length, because of the scope, because you have to take what is probably a bogus story from Frank Sheeran and, and really make it believable. And so I do think <laughs> there's a lot to admire and in the screenplay because of the way that it, it really does inject believability. And I also thought Jojo Rabbit, that I was really close to picking this one because I do think Jojo Rabbit has a wonderful flourish of creativity from Taika Waititi by yes. uh, taking the Hitler imaginary character and making it a fulcrum of the film. And so I was really close to picking Jojo Rabbit, but then I saw Little Women. And I think Little Women wins this one by a bit of a mile because <laughs> uh, in, in one sense, I think that it had the hardest challenge, which is it had to adapt a screenplay that's been adapted so many times, uh, especially oh, yeah. compared to all of these other things um, for a film. We've never really gotten a Joker film before like this. Uh, we've never gotten Jojo Rabbit, Irish. Like, we really haven't gotten movies like this before, whereas Little Women, you have to, like you were saying, Will, be true to the original film, but you also have to do something with this source material that is fresh. And the playing around with the timelines, I think, was a brilliant masterstroke for Gerwig of deciding yeah. to um, switch, do flashbacks and not do everything chronologically. And I think something that gets a little bit under talked about with this screenplay, too, is that she took the words and um, from Louisa May, Louisa May Alcott, uh, things that she actually said and things from her other stories and put them in this. And it fits so well. And I think that is that is just artistry on display that you were able to take this woman who wrote the original source material, take some of her periphery and take the soul of that and be able to just so wonderfully put it into this new movie and capture why that story is timeless. So, yeah, I, I think Little Women is the film really that uh, just absolutely deserves this award more than anyone. And it probably would have been, it's probably the best adapted screenplay, I think, overall that I wouldn't write in any other candidate to beat it. So Little Women, it's our, it's our second unanimous, like wholeheartedly unanimous <laughs> uh, pick because I have to yeah caveat that a little bit. But yeah, adapted screenplay goes to Little Women. Let's go to original screenplay. Yeah, right. uh, this, is, this is probably the toughest category for me. I, I yeah. swear this this one this is painful but let's go it through is. the nominees oh boy okay knives out ryan johnson marriage yes. story noah bombach 1917 yes. sam mendez and christy wilson karen's once upon a time in hollywood quentin tarantino and parasite yeah. bong joon ho and han jin Won. yeah sam good luck <laughs> i know it's really tricky so um well, so it maybe not as tricky as I thought. So uh, I've kind of narrowed it down to two, but choosing between those two is going to be really hard because uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I didn't. I thought the screenplay was actively the worst thing about that movie. So I think that is not the thing that I'm going to uh, be awarding about that one. Which is funny because that's the one that's probably going to win. <laughs> Which is yeah, that's what everyone's been telling me at work. So uh, that's I might just I might just have to bite the bullet with that one. But that is if I'm choosing if I'm voting with my uh my my selection i was about to say with my money but that doesn't make any sense uh if i'm voting i'm not i'm not going with that one uh marriage story and 1917 are in a similar boat in that i don't think the screenplay is bad by any means but they 
uh, are not what stand out to me about either of those movies. 1917, I, f- I feel like, almost could be a silent film and it would work just as well. So uh, no slight to either of them. They're two of my favorite movies of the year. But really, it's coming down to Knives Out and Parasite. And how do I decide between those two? It's I still have not decided. So I'm going to have to talk this out a little bit. Um, Your envelope has gone missing. Uh, it my goes, envelope La La Land. has gone what? missing. <laughs> Search that man! Emma, uh, Emma Stone, I guess that means La La Land wins best original <laughs> screenplay. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, well, Sam needs a second, I guess, or should we go to Will? No, no, no. I want I wanna, okay. I wanna to figure this out, because should I do the same thing I did before and not give it to Parasite Consolation in the interest prize. of preserving it? For another, for another uh, more high-profile category. Because Knives Out, I thought this is the only nomination it got. Uh, and it was really robbed of a couple of them, if you ask me. So, oh, gosh. You know what? I really love Knives Out. I love it a lot. The screenplay for Parasite is so exquisite. It's so perfect. I've seen, I've, I cannot find a flaw in, in Parasite. Uh, and weirdly enough, I, and I don't have time to go into detail about this. There's one loose end in Knives Out, so you know what? It's Parasite. I'm going. Wow. I'm, I'm oh. calling it. That's my pick. All right, Parasite for Sam. Will Ashton, what about you? Is this going to be a little easier for you? What do you think? <laughs> a little bit. Um, so 1917 being nominated for best screenplay is a joke. Um, and You're then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. As much as I love the film overall, I mean, I don't think the screenplay is the strongest aspect of it. Um, I don't think it's quite as much of a lock for best screenplay as you guys make it out to seem because the WGA gave it to uh, Parasite. I don't. I so don't say is, lock. I say it's it's pro. It's the favored one. I would say front runner. It's possible. I mean, it's between those two. It seems, and in that vein, uh, for adapted screenplay, it seems to be between The Irishman and Jojo Rabbit because Jojo Rabbit won the WGA award. So if Jojo Rabbit wins that, that's gonna suck. But that's just my opinion. Um. <laughs> I, I know you guys don't agree with it, so I won't divulge. But for me, um, yeah, it's between Knives Out, Marriage Story, and Parasite. Um, Knives Out, I think, is a really strong screenplay, and there's a lot to admire in that, especially in terms of structure and how it plays with the audience expectations and how everything gets turned on its head in a very satisfying way. Uh, I wasn't quite as taken by the humor in the screenplay or the film, so I think that is a mild caveat that just because this is such a competitive category that I'm going to make it probably the the weakest of the three, which is tough, like you guys said. So it's between Marriage Story and Parasite. And while I really respect the screenplay for Par- or yeah, for Parasite and what it accomplishes, I really also admire how the screenplay for Marriage Story is able to take the filmmaker's life and turn it into something that otherwise could have been, I think John Lutz is like something that could have been grating or unrelatable or something that seemed like very first world problem and turned it into something very relatable and funny and well-crafted and a way that seems kind of simple, but it's also fairly uh, intricate and very moving, I felt, as far as its presentation. So for me, uh, while it's not quite as easy a pick, I, I do think Marriage Story is my personal favorite of the nominees. All right. So one for Parasite, one for Marriage Story. All right. Well, let me open up my envelope. But before I do, <laughs> I, I have to say I'm the opposite of you, Sam, in the sense that I think this and I guess Will, in a sense, I think the screenplay is one of the best things about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think I was the lowest on that mm. film compared to you two. And I actually do really dig the dialogue and the set pieces in the screenplay in the order that they come in. I mean, to be fair, I don't think it's a bad screenplay. I sure. I, I guess it sounds like you're saying it's a weaker aspect of the film than um, other things you liked more about it. Sure. That's what I'm hearing. So, But for yeah. me, I'd say the screenplay is, for me was one of my favorite things about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So it, it's just a little okay. you know, ironic, I suppose. Now, it's not my pick because I do think, like a lot of Tarantino scripts, uh, first of all, it's far, 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 far from his best one. And I think that, and he has been awarded before, so we should point that out. Uh I think that anytime you have to use narration toward the end of a film, it's a, it feels like a little bit of a crutch to me. So I, I kind of hesitate Uh-oh. to elevate this film um, in that sense. So that's so is that why you're not picking Parasite? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the narration in Parasite is different. It's far different um, because it's not connecting the second and the third act. It, it feels more like an epilogue. <laughs> And in that sense, yeah. I don't mind it. Um, but for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's sort of like, oops, we made the, the movie too long. Uh, 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 let's fast forward in time and we'll just fill you in 
that's how it feels um it's yeah. it's not as elegant it's hastily suturing together two different movies for no particular reason right it's not I as elegant it's more as of a stylistic choice but i can see what you mean i i don't think it was for the sake of style i think it was for the sake of like they felt like they needed to wrap things up quicker uh, and I mean, considering that they have narration in hateful eight i was I, mean, I was trying to say that before i think it's far more elegant in hateful eight like it's actually yeah, used sure. to that film's benefit um but regardless not picking once upon a time in hollywood either way uh Good. i'm picking 1917 and here's why uh, i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> not really actually i just wanted okay. to get will's uh, blood boiling a little bit uh <laughs> no 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 i this screenplay is not worthy of oscar consideration uh no for me it was between knives out marriage story and parasite it, it comes pretty close but I do have to knock out Parasite. Uh, as much as I really love that Ooh. film, uh, the screenplay isn't the thing that I love. I don't love the screenplay in that film more than I love the screenplay in Knives Out or Marriage Story. Uh, just, that's huh. just how it turns out for me in particular. I just I just think it's really good. The dialogue is obviously very good. And I think the structure of Parasite is immaculately done. But I think it's not what elevates that film. I think what elevates that film is the uh, the performances and the editing and uh, the production design. For Marriage Story, I really agree with so much of what you're saying, Will, because, uh, again, we talked about this a lot. I think that the idea to have Adam Driver belt out a Sondheim number, the idea to write in this whole section with the with the person observing him um the movie's just full of these like little scenes these little set pieces that are so cinematic and yet so small at the same time and it really is just it's just a wonder work i think marriage story of beautiful scenes and then you have knives out which i i think is is an immaculately crafted screenplay i think that it's it's probably my favorite like ending of all of these films and what leads to that entire moment um, but knives out has several pages of dialogue no i shouldn't say pages it has several exchanges of dialogue that i think are very cringe inducing and that aren't as elegant yeah. and aren't as um polished as mm -hmm. merit story merit story to me feels like near perfect in terms of screenplay material so i give it to merit story and that's that. So Marriage Story is is our original screenplay because uh, Will and I picked God it. God damn it. Yeah. Sam, we just keep <laughs> ganging up on you. Fair enough. But it's it's time to enter the big five, right? No. Yes. Six. Big six. <laughs> um, <laughs> the big six. Uh, the sweet six, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's start with supporting actor, which is what the the broadcast usually starts with. Our nominees include Tom Hanks for A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Anthony Hopkins for The Two Popes, Al Pacino for The Irishman, Joe Pesci for The Irishman, and Brad Pitt for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Sam Noland, who do you pick? Uh, all five of these performances are good, I think. Um, but if I'm really getting down to the wire, gun to my head, who are you going to give a little golden man to? It's coming down to Tom Hanks and Brad Pitt, um, both of which I thought uh, elevated the movie, their movies, respective movies, uh, beyond what they already were into something at least better. Um, I like A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood a lot more than I like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so I feel like that might be coloring my judgment a little bit. But really, I think Tom Hanks better supplements that movie, and rather than sort of taking the spotlight, um, really enhances uh, just the luster of everything going on around him in a way that uh, only the very best of Tom Hanks performances do. So I think that is going to be my pick. Tom Hanks as Fred Rogers. All right. And next we have Will Ashton. Uh, this is going to be a tough one, but, uh, who did you end up going with? Um, no, actually it wasn't that tough for me. Um, while I, I do really admire what Tom Hanks did in his performance and how he's able, able to capture the spirit of Fred Rogers in a way that I felt like wasn't so much mimicking, but rather capturing the essence of, um, I think for me, it's pretty easily Joe Pesci's performance that is my favorite, um, particularly in the way that I think it plays against expectations, uh, certainly compared to like Al Pacino, who I think is very good, but he just kind of plays what you expect from Al Pacino as Hoffa, whereas Joe Pesci is a lot more reserved. You can see a lot more of the calculations at play, and I think what he's able to do in just a glance and just a like twist of the head and just a like simple utterance of a sentence 
is really, really effective. And I think he is kind of like the centerpiece for the Irishman working as well as it does for me. And I think it might be his best performance, which is not saying I'm not saying that lightly. So uh, for me, it has to be Joe Pesci. All right. So one for Tom Hanks, one for Joe Pesci. Yeah, I, I think it's a tough one because I think Hanks, Pesci, and Pitts are really strong. Uh, I like Pacino's performance better than Pesci's, though. Uh, I just It's just a difference in taste, but I do respect that performance in Pesci. I just think that, yeah, that it didn't always work for me. It wasn't as consistent for me as I, I wanted, um, even though I do, th- I do think that it's uh, really commendable. And uh, if it ends up being his final performance... And he goes back in retirement after this. I think that it's a a great note to end his career on. But yeah, for Mm -hmm. me, uh, and I think Hopkins for the two popes, uh, certainly not not a consideration for me. And with Brad Pitt, I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is doing really well with him and, you know, capturing what we love about this actor and merging his persona with uh, a role that's very crowd pleasing, honestly, I, he he is just a, a such a great flavor of this movie, and so much of it works and kind of hangs in the balance because of him. But uh, I'm gonna have to be, I'm I'm gonna have to pick the same thing as you, Sam, because I think Tom Hanks yes. in Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood is just it, it's such a beautiful portrayal, uh, like like we've talked about again and again of this person but in how he he makes he does what a supporting actor should do he makes all the other performances look even better and he is in yeah. f- full service to uh, matthew reese's character which is so hard to do when you're tom hanks playing fred rogers and the fact that he pulls <laughs> it off uh it's an achievement for him it's an achievement for mariel heller the director uh i just think that it's uh it's it's just such a beautiful performance and i think tom hanks deserves this one so uh, Tom Hanks yeah. gets this one over Pesci, which, uh, yeah, it's a, probably not. I don't think that's going to happen with the Academy on Sunday, but we'll I guess we'll <laughs> find out soon. All right, let's get into supporting actress. Uh, this one, this one's tough for me. I'm curious if it's tough for you guys. Uh, the nominees include Kathy Bates for Richard Jewell, Laura Dern for Marriage Story, Scarlett Johansson for Jojo Rabbit, Florence Pugh for Little Women, and Margot Robbie for Bombshell. Sam Noland, who is your pick for supporting actress? I do have a definite pick, although it is close. Um, I thought Kathy Bates was good in Richard Jewell, uh, but not the thing that really stands out in my mind when I think about it. Um, and Margot Robbie, I can't really remember much about her in Bombshell. All it's things baffling considered. she got nominated here. Makes no sense yeah, to me. Yeah, I thought... Because weirdly enough, when the when the uh, nominations first came out, nominations nominations first came <laughs> out, um, I saw Margot Robbie's name and I instantly assumed it was for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I was like, all right, sure, what what are you gonna do? But then I found out it was for Bombshell. I was like, oh, weird. That's not what. It, no, you made you typed in the wrong movie there, Academy. Uh, I don't know what you're doing. Um, uh, Margot Robbie plays Did, a character is it who the doesn't Academy exist? or is it the Iowa Democratic Caucus? Because uh, clearly man. there was a glitch. What a dating this episode. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Let's not predict the awards because that'll date them too fast. Uh, I'm just going to move right on past that. Uh, yeah, Margot Robbie plays a character in Bombshell who's actually like completely made up, kind of out of thin air. So yep. uh, I think there's a reason that she doesn't make as much of an impression as some of the other characters in that movie, for better or worse. Well, she's, to be clear, she's a composite character. She's not entirely fictional. But Fair enough. I'm, yeah. Well, she's her lines are all fictional. She's just sort of like inspired by some loose testimonies right. from a few women. Well, I'm just so. trying to say that like, she's not like a fictional character altogether. Like she's based on different people, but yeah, the, the person that she's playing doesn't exist. So, yeah. So it's really between those, uh, those other three, um, of which I think Laura Dern and for, uh, Florence Pugh were really good in the ensemble. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily single either them, uh, either of them out as, um, really elevating everyone else around them uh and that is no slight to them but that is that is uh, just sort of what i feel uh whereas scarlett johansson i thought really uh elevated jojo rabbit in a way that not a lot of the other actors did so scarlett johansson is going to be my pick i thought the way that she was able to play two different sides of this character how she's a mother 
of a confused, naive young boy uh, who thinks he wants to be a Nazi and doesn't know that there's more to the world than there is, how she has to sort of play to that naive side of her son. Uh, I think Scarlett Johansson get like really nails that, and you and that that uh, is made especially clear in her conversations with Thomas and Mackenzie, in which she's able to be a little more a little more frank and honest about the world. And I think it's a real impressive balancing act, and I think it deserves to be awarded. So Scarlett Johansson is my pick for best supporting actress at the Academy Awards. All right, and Will Ash, what is your pick? All right, I guess I'm gonna make Sam mad. <laughs> uh i i thought scarlett johansson was not good in jojo rabbit like i thought it was a pretty bad performance uh oh, big surprise to... will doesn't like jojo rabbit wait i don't what? even just like jojo rabbit i just I thought it was an average what? it's it's a perfectly fine three out of five movie um but her performance like her accent was never consistent um i thought some of her scenes were pretty cringe inducing as far as the over calculated performance uh i do agree with you that her scene with thomas and mckenzie uh mckenzie mckenzie yep yeah uh i thought that was pretty good but i i'm pretty baffled that this got nominated for best actress but supporting actress i mean um but that's neither here nor there um i thought margot roby did a good job but i just thought she was uh hindered by um, being in a movie that just wasn't very good yeah and given material that just didn't serve her performance well um but i think she did the best she could but i don't think she's my pick kathy bates um good performance i i don't think it's her best work necessarily but i i thought she did a fine job however i wouldn't pick her for this uh for this award and I thought Laura Dern was very good, but I don't think her performance is the one that stands out the most in Marriage Story. So for me, it's pretty easily Florence Pugh for Little Women, not merely because she had a great year with this uh, fighting with my family and especially Midsummer, but I thought that her performance really carried the film well. I have to disagree with what Sam said. I thought her performance was what really kind of brought out the heart and the emotion of the film in many respects and the way that she's able to uh, capture the different ages and uh, evolution of Amy's character was really impressive to me. And I think it just shows that she is truly one of her great actresses on the rise. So for me, it's pretty easily Florence Pugh. All right. So one for Scarlett Johansson, one for Florence Pugh. Uh, I, I also really like Scarlett Johansson's performance in Jojo Rabbit. I do think it's strong. Um, I think Will is just a little, little sour um about it about uh, jojo rabbit um but that's a different conversation we've already had uh but no i i think that uh what, what she's balancing in that movie is is good so i think it's a very solid performance uh similar i have similar thoughts on laura dern i think for marriage story i just think that she captures a type of la divorce lawyer so well um my only thing is that <laughs> she's not in enough of the movie for me to feel like she left as much as an, of an impression as our leads which just really overshadow that movie they really just you know mm -hmm. kind of overwhelm the alan alda ray Liotta performances and everything else uh, and not to the film's detriment but just in a way that i think is noticeable so uh for me it's florence Pugh as well because what i think what she's doing in little women to reclaim a fictional character who has long been demonized and misunderstood since the original novel came out is is really wonderful and it's something that only she could have done in this casting she's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with saoirse ronan who is one of our most celebrated and acclaimed actresses and the fact that she is able to be such a perfect foil to her but also lovable likable understandable and sympathetic but smart calculating honest and amy is what makes the florence p performance <laughs> easily my favorite because they just it's the most memorable i think that her scene explaining how marriage is an economical proposition as is just absolutely chilling but in a way that doesn't make me dislike the character and i think that achievement alone makes this one an easy one for me so uh florence pew and with that uh once again will and i outvote sam it keeps happening and uh it's very surprising considering how much will and i are disagreeing <laughs> on plenty of these uh <laughs> Uh, individual movies but that's fine all right well then let's get into lead actor so this is a good one this is uh this is one that i think could go to two people here i think there's a clear favorite to win but let's go through the nominees there's antonio banderas for pain and glory leonardo dicaprio for once upon a time in hollywood adam driver for marriage story joaquin phoenix for joker and jonathan price for the two popes and some really strong performances in here but sam noland this is your pick uh yeah, I've gone on record as saying that I didn't I couldn't 
bring myself to care about uh, DiCaprio's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so I can't really uh, comfortably give my pick to that one. Uh, Jonathan Price, I thought was uh, quite good in The Two Popes, but just not... Uh, I, I feel like it was a little bit more of a two-hander with that one, so it would be strange to award it to one and not the other. Um, Joaquin Phoenix, I thought, was sort of sort of expectedly good, like just like at the exact level that we expect Joaquin Phoenix to be, which is to say, a very clear and intense level of devotion to uh, capturing this character, um, both physically and mentally, which I think is very impressive, uh, and. Uh, Adam Driver, I think, was also really good, but again, that's Marriage Story. I uh, I feel like, in in my opinion, is more of an ensemble. So uh, that's another one where it would be strange to single out one single uh, performance. But really, and I sort of alluded this to this earlier, I'm still thinking about Antonio Banderas in Pain and Glory. Um, the way that he really gets into the mind of an aging filmmaker whose best days are clearly behind him and has uh, a lot of his past to wrestle with uh, in in order to hopefully, God willing, uh, create a better future. I think that's really impressive, and I would love to see him win this. So that is going to be my pick is Antonio Banderas. All right. Well, Ashton, what say you? Yeah, I mean, for the for me, this is easily the toughest category of the acting nominees. Um, I really enjoyed a lot of these performances, and I found myself having a hard time putting one over the other. Um, when it comes to Joaquin Phoenix, I think he's our best working actor, and I think this past decade has produced some of the best acting of his career, and I think that he is uh, certainly deserving of an Oscar, and if he wins on Sunday, I think that is a basically lifetime achievement that he is warranted although the, the, the performance itself while good i think can be a little one note and restrictive to like i think a script that just doesn't play to his advantage compared to films like say you were never really here the master which allow him to uh have a little bit more depth and complexity and in, in a way that really showcases his range and talents um likewise i think jonathan price does an amazing job. I think his performance is kind of getting overlooked because it's not quite as flashy as the other ones, but the way that he is able to capture the mannerisms and inflections and different key details of, um, who is it? It's uh, Pope, Benedict, Pope Francis. Francis. I keep getting mixed up for some reason. Uh, Pope Francis. Um, I think it's a really, really incredible performance, but not my pick, unfortunately. And Leonardo DiCaprio, I'm much more favorable of it than, Sam is, and that's fine. Um, I, I think it's some of his best character work, and I, I think it's also a really funny and touchy performance. However, um, I, I don't think I can pick it over the two performances I have in mind, which is Antonio Banderas for Pain and Glory and Adam Driver for Marriage Story. Um, especially with Pain and Glory and Antonio Banderas, I think the history that the actor and filmmaker share really are intertwined here as well, given that it's a fairly uh, thinly veiled uh, autobiographical film and I think the history that they share together as long as uh, his openness and willingness to play this filmmaker and also his friend and really captured like Sam was saying uh, a lot of the subtle nuances there a lot of the depth and emotion of this character is something that I found really touching and moving however I think Marriage Story has some of the best acting of the year, and I do agree that it is an ensemble piece. However, I think these two leads just work like firecrackers, and I think Adam Driver's performance, especially coming off of uh past couple years where he's just really been doing consistently great work, uh nonstop basically. Uh I think this is accumulation of what we've been seeing from one of our best rising actors, and I'd be very happy to see him win. So for me, it's gonna be Adam Driver and Marriage Story. All right, so one for Antonio Banderas, one for Adam Driver, two people with names that start with A. Yeah, I there like I like all of these performances. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I think, yeah, I agree with basically everything that's been said to at least some extent. Um, I'm more with you, Will, when it comes to Leonardo DiCaprio. And the fact that I do think Adam Driver really shines, uh, despite Meredith Story being an ensemble, uh, his, his entire number with the Sondheim being a live scene is just... Uh, <laughs> it's a good one. It's just really good. Uh, Adam Driver is one of our best actors too. I think that it's it's intriguing to see him in Phoenix here because they they are very different actors, obviously. But I think that we are looking at 
uh, two very artistically driven actors, sort of like one really on the rise and one comfortably at their peak. Um, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully Joaquin Phoenix has even more to impress us with um, with the rest of his career. But it's Antonio Banderas for Pain and Glory. Come on. Uh, this performance <laughs> is is just absolutely beautiful in every which way. And I'm, I'm more leaning toward uh, your arguments, Sam. They were the same ones I had in my mind compared to Adam Driver, where I think that he is the the firm lead of the film, and the just just the fact that he's able to do a performance like we've never really seen from him before, where he's able to pull off uh, being this 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 director, aging director in a body that is failing him, and how he portrays that through simple expression, through tone of voice and narration, and it. it it just works so well for me. And this performance I just think is so lovely and unexpected and uh, I could study and scrutinize it for, for years and years. So for me, it's Antonio Banderas, uh, though it's pretty close. I think Adam driver was very strong as well. And uh, he comes close for me as well. So for this one, Sam and I outrank when, when are Sam and Will going to outrank me? I wonder. (laughs) Oh, well, we got three, we got three categories left. So the clock is ticking. Let's wind this down then. Let's get into lead yeah. actress. The Academy Award for lead actress nominees are Cynthia Erivo for Harriet, Scarlett Johansson for Marriage Story, Saoirse Ronan for Little Women, Charlize Theron for Bombshell, and Renee Zellweger for Judy. Sam Nolan, who do you pick? Yeah, this is, uh, it, it might contradict a little uh, something that I said with the supporting actress category, but I think when I'm looking at these five nominees, the one that uh, stands out to me more so than the other four is uh, Saoirse Ronan in Little Women. I think um, as an anchor of this huge sprawling, like takes place over multiple years with all these different people story, uh, I think Saoirse Ronan is really impressive in the way that she's able to always sort of be at the center of it, always give us uh, sort of a moral uh, a moral jumping off point with which to... With which to uh, ingratiate ourselves in what is going on at any given point in the story not to mention how uh she is uh sort of and this is and this is no secret um sort of playing louisa may alcott at the beginning in like some sort of strange abstract way uh while also playing josephine march um i think it's a really layered performance and i think it it builds to a couple of crescendos especially uh one speech at the end if you've seen the movie you'll know which one i mean uh that really stick out when i think back at the movie so that is the one i'm gonna go with saoirse ronan and greta gerwig are are proving to be a match made in heaven consistently and i think this is only only the beginning let's hope all right well ashton yeah i mean this one is pretty tough as well though I think it's mainly between two performances. Um, I'll just say that I think Charlize Theron was fine in Bombshell, but again, this movie wasn't very good, and I don't think her performance is necessarily a words worthy. Um, Cynthia Ervo, I thought, you know, gave a great performance. However, the film itself was uh, just not quite living up to it, unfortunately. And I think she has a fantastic career ahead of her, so I think she'll get another nomination somewhere down the line. Uh, Renee Zellweger, you know, good. I think, you know, it's what you expect, though, from the Oscars. And I, I mean, Sam and I, we talked about it in our own separate episode. I think it's a performance worth celebrating, but it's also a performance I just haven't really been thinking about much. Yeah, it's an Oscar performance right. with a little trademark, like through yeah, and through. It just has all those cliches, like, you know, like a singing performance based on a famous Hollywood figure, you know, it just it, tragedy, biopic, it just it just hits all the, the cliches. Um, so for me, it's between Charche Ronan and Little Women and Scarlett Johansson and Marriage Story. Um, well, I really, really enjoyed Charche Ronan's performance and I think everything Sam said, I agree with. For me, I, I still feel it's part of an ensemble, I guess. I don't see it as quite the lead performance as you do, though I do think it is very good. I just, I think for me, it has to be Scarlett Johansson and Marriage Story, which is funny because I think Scarlett Johansson is easily the least deserving in the supporting actress category. Here, I thought she was fantastic and easily, you know, it's a one-two punch with her and Adam Driver. I thought they were just both fantastic and they complement each other's performances so well, as well as doing great work individually throughout the film. So for me, it's pretty easily Scarlett Johansson and Marriage Story. Wow. This is, uh, yeah. How do we <laughs> define lead actress? Webster's Dictionary says that... No, uh, yeah, so I won't 
I won't reiterate what you all have already really laid out here. First of all, it's a crime that Florence Pugh didn't get nominated for Midsummer here, because that is sure, who yeah. I would have picked. Um, but if we have to pick, uh, for me, it's between two as well. Like with you all, it's uh, yeah, it's either Scarlett Johansson or Saoirse Ronan. Uh, the, the difficulty with Saoirse Ronan is that it is such an ensemble. And it, I do struggle a little bit to say, okay, is this a film where I feel like Saoirse Ronan is in command of this film where it lives or dies by her? And in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. I think that she's so good, we don't even notice how bad Emma Watson is. And <laughs> then with Scarlett Johansson for Marriage Story, I struggle with that as well because I think that she's noticeably absent in the second half of the film. And as much as I really enjoy the opening of the film and how how we get to know her relationship with Adam Driver's character is important and all of that, again, she just she has an incredible monologue, uh, probably the best monologue of 2019. And yet, for much of the second half, she's sort of a ghost on Adam Driver, like a pox in Adam Driver's household. And uh, that's why I picked Scarlett Johansson, because I think this performance oh. is so strong and it is so affecting that we don't forget she's in this movie. And we, her presence is never lost on us the second half of the film. And I think that it does influence the quality of the film in a much more direct way, despite her not even being in a lot of scenes in the second half, compared to Sir Ronan, who I think is also indispensable to that film, but does so much that I almost feel like Scarlett Johansson does less or does more with less. So I go with Johansson for marriage story. Uh, there you go. Uh, tough one, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. I just will, will and Sam, you guys can't agree on anything and that's why you can't <laughs> outvote me. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the case. Well, let's see where directing goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heard that before. All right. Well, let's go into best director. <laughs> The nominees okay. include Martin Scorsese for The Irishman, Todd Phillips for Joker for some reason, Sam Mendes for 1917, Quentin Tarantino for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Bong Joon-ho for Parasite. Sam Nolan, who's your pick? Uh, as much as I want to commend my fellow Sam, uh, it's it's Bong Joon-ho. It's no contest. There's I, I cannot see this... Uh, uh, in my mind, going to anyone else other than Bong Joon Ho. Everything about that movie fits together so perfectly. All the individual elements we've discussed throughout the throughout the duration of this episode, uh, they all work because Bong Joon Ho is overseeing it all, and in an utterly fantastic way that made for one of just the best goddamn movies of 2019, if not the best. The more I think about it, so that is my pick. Uh, no contest. Like, I don't even know who would be in second place. That's It's that much of a lead. Okay, there goes Sam's pick. Um, what about you, Will? Yeah, I mean, I'm in agreement with Sam. I think this is Bong Joon-ho's award, in my view. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it would be, I guess, uh, the Irishman and Once Upon a Time Hollywood competing for second place. Um, but yeah, I just think everything that Sam said, I have to agree with just as far as how this movie is crafted, meticulousness of it, but in a way that seems like almost effortless in its own way, in a good way. Like it feels like Bong Joon Ho just is naturally a, just knows how to make a movie and he does it really well and very smart. And he is just a master filmmaker. And I think he's proven that several times already. And while Parasite is my favorite film of his, I think it's one that's very well deserving, and I I think he's overdue to receive uh, an accolade such as this one. So it's pretty easy to see how I would feel that he is the best pick here. Hmm. Sorry, that last sentence came out a little weird. <laughs> uh oh. Um. What? Spaghetti what is. about me? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about little for old me? John? <laughs> What about what about our old pal, uh, Johnny Smooth? Uh, let's see. Well, let's start with who I would not give this to. Definitely not Scorsese or Phillips. Um, I like yep. The Irishman. I just just don't think it's the best directed film. And Joker, I I still baffled by all everything that's going on with that film and its <laughs> its nominations. And and Tarantino, I think is. It, Great director, just not his best work here. Not cl close enough to it where I feel like I'd be comfortable giving him the award. So it is between Sam Mendes and Bong Joon-ho. And I think that Sam Mendes does such a tremendous job with 1917. Already really talked about this. 
Uh, Parasite is the better film, and part of the reason for that is Bong Joon-ho's singular vision and what he brings to it, and he's such an auteur, and this is the most auteur film, where you can tell he's making this film for him, and it's his story, and a lot of that goes into the directing chair, but just the fact that nobody else could have made this film, not just nobody else could have made this film quite like him, it, it really is just that stamp that I was looking for to try to put one film over the other and it just helps that parasite is the best film out of all of these these and uh yeah i uh i feel pretty comfortable letting this be yet another unanimous pick for us yeah. three so bong joon ho for parasite though wasn't super close for me it was a little tough before we get into best picture there were a few technical categories we just don't have time to get into uh, they include like makeup and hair costume design some of the sound ones uh, we will be posting our picks for those in written form, so you can check that out in the show notes. But we apologize. Not that we disrespect these categories, but we had to draw the line somewhere. So let's get into Best Picture. The nominees include, and we'll start with Will Ashton this time, but the nominees include Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, <laughs> Jojo, Jojo Rabbit, Jojo Rabbit, and Jojo Rabbit. So between all those nominees... Uh, which Jojo Rabbit do you pick, Willash? Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to take the bullet to the head. <laughs> and then tear up your, your envelope and throw it in the trash. Uh, <laughs> Sam Nolan, uh, the, the nominees actually include uh, Jojo Rabbit, Rabbit and <laughs> Ford versus Ferrari, The Irishman, Joker, Little Women, Marriage Story, 1917, Once Upon a Time in... Hollywood and Parasite. Yeah. Uh this is another no-brainer. Um the more I think about it, the more clear it becomes to me that uh Ford v Ferrari should not win this award because Parasite <laughs> should win. It oh, come gosh. on, it's the best it's, it's the best Rabbit's picture award, of the year. <laughs> yeah. Uh it's I I don't need to elaborate on on Parasite anymore. It's uh it's deserving of a, of a of pretty much anything it can possibly get, and and not the least of which is the big daddy of them all, Best Picture. I think it is not even close. Uh, Parasite is once again my pick for this award. All right, Will Ashton, tell us all about what brought you to Jojo Rabbit being the best picture for you. Yeah. Well, not not that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and no for Joker or Ford versus Ferrari or uh, 1917. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think besides those films, uh, I think all these other films were pretty strong and noteworthy, and I'm happy that they got nominated, and I think they're deserving of uh, their critical and commercial accolades. However, I if, if it's just going to go off of what I think, I mean, I'd be perfectly happy with Parasite winning, and I think it's well deserving if it does. Um, I'd also be fine. I guess I'm in the minority in thinking that Once Upon a Time Hollywood is a very good film, and I'd I, I think it's much more rewatchable than a lot of these other films. Uh, so I, I'd be fine with that being nominee as well. Ditto the Irishman, but uh, I don't know. I guess I'm gonna go with Marriage Story. I just think all around it's a really really solid, well made movie, and I. I think for all the reasons i've already said i think it's my favorite so i won't elaborate anymore yeah it's funny because a lot of these films would make history uh if they won well i guess two of them um i guess uh little women uh not really i guess but uh because i was gonna say we, we've, we've seen best picture go to uh films directed by women before but in terms of like marriage story right it would be the first like netflix film ever to wear mm -hmm. like a streaming release film to ever win best Ditto picture and, irishman yeah yeah and then and then parasite yeah good point parasite would be the first like foreign language film and so that would be just unbelievable so we, yep. we've talked about all these films that i would be happy with almost all of these films winning i think joker even joker i it's it'd be fine i who cares uh it's it's not a film that i think is actively bad <laughs> but in most respects and I respect all of these films um, in different ways and, and to different degrees, though. And I think that the top films here for me include like Little Women, Marriage Story, 1917, Jojo Rabbit and Parasite. And it's Parasite. It, it, it was always Parasite because I just yeah. think that it is the best picture. It's the film that uh, it would make history, which is a huge plus going for it. And I just think that it's 
just the fact that it works so well for so many different people, despite being a foreign language film, which can be a ridiculous barrier for some people to watch a film. And, and it, which I just don't understand. Like if it has subtitles, some people think that that means they won't like it, which I think parasite yeah. has broken down so many barriers for that and hopefully opened up a love of film outside of America and like English speaking countries that a lot of people would have had otherwise. So just the fact that it's even nominated is wonderful to see because so many people will enjoy this film and be like, Oh wow. Like America isn't the center of the world <laughs> right like and the uk right so imagine that we we can like what like there are films out there that can speak to us that are made by other cultures that will impact us far better and far uh, heavier than we would have expected otherwise and i just think parasite is such a glowing example of that and uh yeah parasite goes to best picture for me so then it's not only was it our our top Wait, film i think of, you, yeah go ahead oh, i think you you said that backwards Best picture goes to Parasite. I think what you meant to say, but you said um, Parasite goes to best picture. Well, that too, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so not only was it our our top film of all the cinemaholics on that episode, but it's also our pick for the Oscars. What a surprise! Um, but that'll yeah. do it then for our if we pick the winners. If we picked the winners special, thank you so much for listening. Gentlemen, it's it's been fun. It's been a, a hefty discussion, a sort of re-walk through uh, through 2019. I didn't think we'd be doing that again so soon. But uh, thank you so much for being on and talking about all the nooks and crannies of Oscars 2020, except for a few of the uh, categories that we didn't get to. Yeah. All right. Yep. With that, we'll see you all for the main show coming up later this week. Enjoy the Oscars broadcast. We can't wait to see who the winners are or hopefully aren't. <laughs> but until then, from the Internet of California, I'm John Agroni. From the Internet of Pennsylvania, I'm Washington. And from the Internet Colorado, I'm Sam Noland. See you next year. <laughs>